We're flipping the script with Drew Stein, the maestro behind Audigent, who's not just playing the ad tech game. He's totally rewriting the rules. From the high stakes world of finance to the creative chaos of advertising, Drew's leap is more than a career pivot. It's a crusade to marry data with creativity. But what does curating in ad tech even mean? Is it an art, a science, or just the latest buzzword? Buckle up as we ask Drew to decode this mystery and also know more than you did yesterday. Welcome to the Ad Attach Show, where marketing, media, and ad tech merge. Stay tuned as your host, Pesach Latin, navigates you through the evolving landscape of marketing trends and advertising innovations. I am your host, Pesach Latin. Today on the Ad Attach Show, we are looking into the data driven world of Drew Stein of Autogent, where cookies are out and innovation is in. We're going to explore how Autogent's game changing tech is turning the ad world volume to 11, one first party data point at a time. Hey, Drew, before we get started, how are you doing? I'm so well, Pesach. Thank you for having me here and uh, excited to, uh, to share more with you about Audigent and our mission and what it is that we've been uh, accomplishing. And just, yeah, I, uh, just, just want to say, ahead, sorry. That, love the work that you're doing. Uh, and I, I, I'm actually a follower of yours and uh, think that the content you're putting out is absolutely fantastic. So thank you for having me and thanks for uh, fighting the good fight and putting out so much great content around ad tech. I appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, couldn't do without people like you. Obviously, we need guests. Um, that reminds me, whoever wants to be a guest, hit me up. I honestly, you know, I read a bunch about what you do, and I have to be honest, you yourself made a significant transition from finance yes. to creative world ad tech to blend creativity with technology. And I try to find out really what exactly you're curating. And the, the, best guess I can have is if, if you guys were like a big collection of baseball cards and each card represented a player with different strengths and teams and I wanted to create the best team for a specific game or match my collection against a friend's team based on certain strengths such as batting average, pitching speed, and fielding skills, Audigent does the same way kind of with ads. Yeah, I mean, curation is a, is a really exciting topic right now, but at, at, at its core, it's pretty simple. There's an old way and a new way, right? The old way as an industry, we were taking data, we were putting it solely through the buy side and using tools like DSP platforms to look at all of those different data sources and address open exchange inventory and then essentially become the optimization tool for all that great data and all that great inventory. Curation is simply putting data through the supply path, right? It's the new way and it opens opens up the door to a new treasure chest of opportunity to look at audiences against inventory in a new way, to optimize them, to future-proof the connections that the industry has, has between the data, the buy side, and the sell side. And it ushers in a new way of, of activating data in a way that's also privacy-safe and consumer-friendly. So Simply put, it's the same audience targeting that we know and love, but it's applying it through a different part of the value chain. Old way is all about the buy side. New way is about how we marry data with the sell side in order to achieve even better, more exciting results for brands and media agencies. Can you take me through the journey? I, I see that you know that you originally wanted to be a data management platform, a 2.0 data management platform. Yes. And you somehow ended up being a curation company along the way. Yeah. I mean, I, I think we didn't even know we were a curation company. We, we didn't even learn a DMP. I, we started off life. We knew we were going to do something different. We wanted to be a next gen 2.0 DMP. We were going to rewrite the rules, clean, intelligent data, opt in data. We knew that we were going to start off with a very pristine, uh, you know, data asset. And we knew we wanted to be on the side of, of public was helping them to activate, uh, all that great data. So. We started off as what we thought was going to be a DMP, and then we did what DMPs do. We would aggregate the data, we would clean the data, we would create high-performing taxonomy and segmentation, and then we'd punt it. We'd punt it into a DSP or a data marketplace, and then we'd have to wait 30 or 45 or 60 days to finally get back some kind of report, whether the data was used or not. And it would be like one line, it was spent, did someone spend money on it? Did they not spend money on it? And we just said... 
This doesn't make any sense. How is it in an ecosystem that has so much real-time data on the buy side and so much rich signal on the sell side, right? Right. How could the data companies have zero signal? How could we have no idea whether we were adding value uh, with the data sets that we were providing? And that's when the light bulb kind of went off. And we wound up going to partners like Xander and Pubmatic and we said, hey, we want to experiment with putting, this is five plus years ago, putting data through the supply path. What would it be like if we packaged data and inventory, if we enriched or if we curated our data against your inventory and put it together in a PMP or a deal ID, right? And send it to our clients that way instead of a DMP segment. And the rest was history, right? It, Xander was Xander Curate. We alpha beta launched with them. We alpha beta launched Encore, which is now Connect with Pomatic, uh, two very robust partners and platforms. And we were off to the races. Five years later, curation is now a billion dollar part of the ecosystem. And the next five years, it'll go from one to five billion in half that time with the amount of exciting players coming into it. But the basics are uh, data through the supply path is exciting. It works. It can be future proofed. It can provide a lot of value added insights. And it opens the door to doing things that we couldn't do the old way. So we just got frustrated. Uh, we got frustrated with the fact that we had to wait so long that we had no way to optimize. Now we've got all this great signal and we can do things that everyone else was doing. We can optimize. We can future-proof. We can provide value in a way that we couldn't do it before. How do you think that your background in finance uh, shaped your approach to data and analytics? Well, it's it's funny. There's always a right answer, right, in, in finance. And there there's a, whether it's valuation or whether... Uh, you're working on a, you know, some kind of M&A transaction or some kind of financing. There's, there's a, like an IPO or secondary. There's kind of a right answer. There's a goal that you're kind of working towards. And there's a discipline towards getting there. And that's the same within media. It's a lot of numbers. Uh, it's a lot of math. And, and there's a lot of discipline to, to kind of get there. You know, it, it's funny. I, I think about my time in finance. It, it, helped me focus. It, it helped develop an analytical side. It helped me to become very numbers driven about my approach to finding the right answers. And in media, there are right answers, right? There's the right kind of performance. You have to, you're working towards goals. There's the right kind of targeting. There's the right recipes for coming up with an answer. And so there are some similarities between the two, but I, th I think it's the, the rigor of the analysis that you do as whether you're in finance and the rigor that you do in the analysis as a, from a data science perspective to find efficacy that are just very, very basically similar. Do you think that uh, data scientists are, are somewhat agnostic, for lack of a better word, when it came to results? I think a lot of data science was used on the front end, but less so on the back end. And part of that has to do with the tools. I mean, log level data is kind of new here. Right. Right? Data science was always thought of something we did up front to build audiences that have efficacy and drive performance. After that, I think a lot of people would walk away. They would punt. Traditionally, they would punt their data segments. They would walk away. If they work, they're geniuses. If they don't work, you obviously did something wrong with your hands on keyboard. We're at a place where that's no longer the case anymore, right? When you when you are actively involved in optimizing data through through the campaign cycle now, which is what we're capable of doing as a data company, you have a, a very different conversation and relationship around analytics. It's the same when you're getting that log level data back. It allows data companies to be data companies again and and use data science to inform the performance and to optimize. And I think that's the big difference. I think before they would they were just looking at kind of the beginning of a campaign and how they put audiences together and then walking away. Now you actually have to put your money where your mouth is. You have to not just put use data science on the front end to create those audiences. You also have to use data science around the back end where you take that log level data or you take all of that performance data and you have to show and prove what you provided was valuable and be able to optimize it in a loop. Uh, and I think that's why why there's been this quantum shift from, from uh, you know, in terms of like really focusing on performance. What challenges did you face in the early stages of creating Autogen? Oh, 
There were so many. I could tell you six, seven years ago when we're talking about D being a DMP, people are like, you want to build a DMP? That's crazy. You know, you want to build a data company in this day and age? There, You know, that's that's over with. It's all about right. the CDP or it's all about some other acronym. And uh, I think people thought we were crazy. I mean, we don't look too crazy now. I mean, it's it's uh, hindsight 20 with the code that we have across <laughs> Over 2 million websites, mobile sites, mobile apps, the implications of what that means for being at the forefront of privacy sandbox and, uh, and the deprecation of cookies. Uh, we look pretty good in hindsight 2020. I think a lot of people wish they started uh, DMPs uh, six or seven years ago now thinking about uh, you know, where, where we're at. But yeah, I mean, we had uh, some challenges going through what I'll call, you know, we go up and we hear no a lot raising money. Uh, it's not cheap to build uh, something that, like what we built. We've raised $40 million to date to be a data technology and data infrastructure company for our pub partners, for our other data partners, uh, and to provide what we do for media agencies and brands. I'd say early on, the hardest thing was in, you know, we were at a very out of, ad tech was very out of favor in the venture cycle, and specifically data and DMP. Uh, style companies like ours were extremely out of favor on top of that. So we picked an out of favor product and an out of favor cycle industry and, but, you know, managed through it just frankly by building a great product and having to show and prove every step of the way, every moment proving ourselves. And eventually you hit your numbers every year or exceed them for five years in a row. And all of a sudden people's attention perks up and things become a little easier. But Early on, man, was it hard to raise capital. Was there this point where you, like an aha moment where you realize, oh, we're not going to be a data management platform. We need to be, we're going to be something different. And you're like, oh, we're going to be a curation company. <laughs> no, it was Greg Williams who finally, uh, when he uh, came over from Media Map, uh, right. it was Greg that finally, and he's the president of our company, that the first thing he said, he goes, Drew, you know, you're a curation company. And I said, curation? I don't even know what that is. He's like, well, you're curating all your data against the supply path. And I said, Greg, we're a 2.0 DMP. And he's like, Drew, he's like, you are something so different than that at this point. And I know people aren't using this term now. And this was, I don't know, three and a half years ago when he was just a, a senior advisor before he officially became president. And somewhere in, he's like, but you are, I think, the industry's first curation company. And that's when... Finally, I think we took a step back and embraced it. And I said, you know, Greg, I, I think we are a curation company or whatever that is. And we embraced that moniker. And now it's a huge thing. And now it's a, like I said, it's a. Yeah, I think DigiDay had a WTF on it just recently, right? Yeah. You know, you made it big when you when you got there. <laughs> we're, we're a box in the loom escape, right? <laughs> People are talking about curators <laughs> and curation. But it was Greg Williams that I have to give credit. He was the one that said, no, you're not true. You are this new thing. And, and it's it's time we embrace it and go forward. And we did. So I'm curious, moving on to first party and third party depreciation, how does Audigent's curation model address the imminent changes we're having? Oh, yeah. I mean... It, well, first, I think the exciting part about curation is it doesn't rely on the old way of data distribution. The old way is you have cookies, you host matching tables, you distribute data to the buy side and sell side daily, hourly, right? You're constantly updating your segmentation. Once you move data to the supply path, when you start curating data, it opens up the door to a completely new way of integrating with the supply path, and that's in real time. So gone are cookies, gone are matching tables, gone are the kind of traditional ways of distributing data over and over again. And what that gets replaced with is what we call, we joke, it's called our, it's RTDP, real-time data protocol integrations, but we joke and call it R2D2 integrations. But what you're, uh, hey, you can't take the Star Wars out of the, the, the tech company. But what that opens the door to is this new robust way of real-time integration with the supply path. So we are co-locating in the same data centers with our SSP partners. We have a sub five millisecond round trip where we are able to see those bids, enrich those bids before they even go to the DSP. None of that was possible. Do you have a term for this yet? Like some sort of like feedback or? R RTDP, real-time data protocol. That's how you real, that is the term. 
Yes. Oh, uh, yeah. Though I think uh, most of our clients also joke with us. We all call it R two D two integrations at this point. But it, but essentially, it's these. It's a real time integration with the supply path that allows us to make a real time decision around the segmentation of that impression. And what that opens the door to is not only a lightning fast round trip, but once you remove the barriers of all of these matching tables and all of these these cookies. It opens the door to a whole world of probabilistic and predictive data sets that we couldn't have before, right? The old way, we were crack addicted to -to one-to-one deterministic cookies. The new way opens the door to a probabilistic or predictive identifier like a Hadron. That's that's Hadron right above me right there. That's the first solutions architecture of Hadron ID. Uh, and it opens up the door to uh, to hadron some ideas. Your cookie, your cookieless solution yeah. that you've had for a while, actually, yeah. right? And, and a hadron could be one to one. It could be one to thirty. It could be one to two million. But once you open the door to these real time connections, all of a sudden you can use parts of your brain that you, as a data company, that you weren't able to use before, right? If you're if you're locked into always shipping a deterministic identifier, which is one to one with a single insight, you are locked in it, right? You, everything becomes, you know, uh, static in terms of the insights you have. When you can dynamically look at an impression in real time and use every part of your brain to potentially inform that insight, the in, inform that impression, and go beyond a one to one identifier like a cookie and use things that could be probabilistic or cohort based or, you know, you know, or predictive. It's really exciting in terms of the insights that you might be able to use to enrich that impression and drive value and performance for that brand or media agency. So we're just joking on another show about cohorts and we just have to keep on making these new terms for audiences and segments or whatever you want to call it. Now they're cohorts. Well, when I think of cohorts, I, 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 you know, To me, that that's kind of the, is this person, is it a one-to-one match or is this a one-to-many match? And when you group people into cohorts, it's a privacy safe, it's a, it's a consumer friendly way to think about how do we put people together without having to reveal the individual identity of a single person. I think ultimately we're all trying to build a better ecosystem here. We're all trying to create an ecosystem that is consumer friendly and and what cohorts enables us to do is have interesting insights around groups of people without having to continuously be addicted at the point of targeting to that one to one match listen one to one matches are uh, are really important when it comes to ten percent of the use cases you know in a, in our ecosystem but like ninety percent of the ecosystem use cases you can use a probabilistic or predictive Contextual is all probabilistic, right? That is the number one most used probabilistic insight that you can have, contextual. And contextual is incredibly powerful. This is, you know, this is, uh, contextual has got, has moved from 1.0 way back when, when it was lexicographical and it was only keyword based. We've, we've even blown past the semantic stacks that exist today. And, and the semantic stacks are really powerful because they have great insight into actual meaning, contextual meaning of a page to where we're at the predictive stage. And we're, we're moving to contextual 3.0. That's all predictive. I joke, you know, the old style contextual could look at a page and say hot dog was a food, right? That then we move to semantic stacks that could differentiate between hot dog the food, hot dog the dog that's hot in the car, and hot dog the dude doing helicopter spins as he goes down the ski slope, right? Well, that's where semantic stacks moved us, and those that was a big improvement. But now we've moved to this place where if it is hot dog the food, stacks like ours and the stacks like we build with Experian around predictive audience data can then say, hey, if it is hot dog the food. That person needs a beer or ketchup, or maybe they need mustard, right? And that's need based, and that's where contextual is heading. So when we think about right those those real time integrations that we have, those are the kinds of game time decisions that you can make in five milliseconds when you have real connections that you can't make if all you do is ship data in these one to one 
uh, deterministic identifiers that never move because they're hosted in matching tables and have to be shipped a week in advance. When you can use your whole brain, a single cookie-based identifier or any deterministic identifier, it really opens up the door for some very exciting new ways of, and consumer-friendly ways without cookies of informing that, that bid. Uh, to drive efficacy for the the uh, that brand or that media agency. How does consumer pricing benefit the publishers and advertisers? Dynamic pricing, I'm sorry. Yeah, well, I mean, so it's pretty simple. Like the old way, most uh, DMP segments were static pricing. They're CPM-based. So let's say you're buying a segment and right. you're trying to buy against display and it's 3 a.m. in the morning and your price of display drops to a buck fifty. Right, you're packaged and out the door for three dollars. When you move to dynamic pricing, the exact same audience segment might cost you, you know, instead of three dollars, you might be able to buy that exact same impression for two bucks, but something significantly less. Now it fluctuates dynamically over the course of the day, but so does pricing. What what buy side algorithms do very well is keep everyone on the data side honest, right? Because it it forbids you to buy something that doesn't drive value or performance. If you provide a package of data and inventory that's too expensive or doesn't perform, a buy, there is not a buy-side algorithm in the world that will buy against it. It just shuts you off. And it, it doesn't like wait a day. It's like, boom, instant. If you're too expensive or you don't perform, the buy-side algorithms are excellent at stopping the spend that would otherwise go So, you know, to that PMP. So for us, it always forces us to drive value and performance no matter what that package of, of data and inventory looks like, or we don't make a penny. How do you see the role of creation evolving in the advertising industry, and what future developments can we expect from Autogent? Well, I, I think our AI roadmap is, is beyond exciting, and I've said this on stage before, uh, different panels, for real data companies, for data infrastructure companies, for data technology companies like ours, what AI enables us to have is the equivalent of two or 300 data scientists on staff 24-7-360. That's exciting. For, for data geeks like us, where, where we are constantly measuring, where we're constantly analyzing, where we're constantly optimizing, the ability to automate all of that and get better and smarter and drive more efficacy around you know, the data and combined data and inventory packages we have are massively going to benefit from these changes, right? The, the old way, we don't really have the ability to flex and build technology on the buy side. The way we can flex with partners index exchanges is a great example of a partner that really has opened up their architecture to allow companies like ours to build something great on top of that and to you know and so when i think of curation and where it's heading right the uh, the ability for us to continue to invest in our stack doing what we do well continuing to get smarter about not only how to package but how to optimize all of these signals is really what the future of curation is about and there's great partners that are that are coming into it, and I think they recognize the potential. I mean, Pesach, we're in the first inning of, right. of curation. Is, like, there, is there anything that you could build right now, technolo technology-wise, that you can't just because you don't have access or just not feasible? Anything you'd want to curate in, in the ad tech industry, that is? I think we have pretty good access. I think everyone's right. kind of jumping into the game uh, right now and, and opening up the door. Is there anything um, not in real time that should be? Well, I think a lot of the buy side data. I mean, right. just remember, we're, we're only we've only done all of this because the opportunity doesn't exist in the same way from the buy side. I, I actually think there'll be some real back to the future moments. I I don't think it's one or the other. By the way, I think well, I think when, when you talk about like dynamic pricing, it really goes reminds me of like two thousand. Right, media first came out with this, and you had yeah. a slider scale and everything, and everyone said they were crazy. Yeah. Now. Well, I, I do think you use it for everything. Yeah. I, well, listen, I think dynamic pricing benefits media agencies and brands. And I think it is also there a benefits. problem with billing, though? Have you had any agencies that. No. SSP is a tremendous job. The SSP stacks are more sophisticated than they've ever been. Right. Um, and by the way, like, I'm bullish on, on the future for what buy side stacks are going to be able to do with data. I think we're, we're now, you know, I'd say Trade Desk is at the forefront. If there's any stack out there where the buy side data is still really doing well, 
Uh, that's an example of a stack where the, the I think the future of buy side data is exciting. I think they're also opening the door to, uh, you know, whether it's custom bidding algorithms or whether it's real time data integrations uh, for contextual on the front end. I think the trade desk is actually doing a fantastic job. And, and I think uh, from the, from a buy side data perspective. So, you know, when I think about the future of curation, I, I think about this, I think about uh, some kind of balance between buy side and sell side data. There's also the pers- the, the ability to apply percentages also on the buy side on uh, platforms like the trade desk. So I, I, I do think that we're going to see both sides be healthy moving forward. But when it comes to cookie data, I think that sell side is, is frankly just more uh, is more invested and more advanced in, at this point. We all have things that keep us up late at night or fuel our daydreams. Is there something right now that's like really in your mind space? space? Well, there's a lot of stuff that's out of our control, obviously. Um, we have no crystal ball when it comes to regulation. And the ad tech industry is really not driving the narrative uh, around ad tech. You know, ad tech that drive the privacy narrative. I, I think Google. I think Google is. Unfortunately, Apple, Apple is actually Google, funny. Apple, yeah, and uh, maybe Facebook, the FTC. Facebook, you know, the funny thing is, Apple drove the narrative far before Google ever drove the narrative, and right. so well, especially it, on the mobile side, yeah, and so did Facebook. And you know, so I, I think as an industry, we have to start helping the broader consumer, broader regulatory world really understand the difference between ad tech and big tech. You know, it's funny. For so long, people have said, hey, you know, we're in media or we're in data, we're programmatic, we're, you know, this is not life or death here, we're not solving, you know, the world's problems. And, and I, for some reason, I used to, uh, you know, I'd be like, oh, yeah, no, this is just commerce. I don't believe that anymore. I think we're talking about the free internet at this point. I think yeah, Dave Morgan said this yesterday, yesterday interview him last week, but he we just released today his interview. He basically said he feels like the, the, the advertising especially when you go to places like Ukraine, you get to see how important this is because there are countries, Russia being one, where where without advertising, there's no free media. Free the government media controls is, everything. Free media is absolutely critical to political discourse. Free media is, is, right? I mean, when you look at the toxic echo chamber of social media, Right, and my belief is that those algorithms. Any, sp- any specific social? Any specific one? I mean, how about all of them? <laughs> <laughs> like, how about? And no, you don't need to be specific. They, I think yes. generally any educated person can look at the the echo chamber that is social media and know these algorithms are feeding you just crap all of the time, and the amount of disinformation is scary across these networks. So when I think about what it is that we do, I, I do think it's actually very, very important that we nail this. I do think that ad tech companies need to own the, their privacy narrative because we are the ones at the forefront of protecting the free internet, right? What we do actually is very important. What we do absolutely matters because monetizing the content of publishers, okay, monetizing the data of publishers and keeping them healthy and in business drives a lot of this great content that's out there, which is critical for societies like ours to even function. And I do think that, you know, as an industry, we've we've missed the boat. We have to start seeing how important we actually are. And perhaps like, it, you know, it's sad. John Stewart was a good example. It's like, oh, how many, he just came back to television. And one of the audience questions that he had was, you know, does it bother you that, you know, all of these kids these days are getting all of their news from social media? And the answer is, of course, yeah, how can it not bother people, uh, you know, that are out there? Um, but we have an industry that I think is important. We have literally the engine that keeps the free press, keeps the free media and all of that content in business and churning. So, you know, those are the kinds of, so you ask me what keeps me up at night. That keeps me up at night, right? The responsibility? The responsibility. That's why I'm hearing more and more from people, not from from people more our age than people younger, is that as they got older, they realized this isn't just a business. And you're like the third person this week I've had this conversation with, that there's a responsibility, not just to their employees, but to to the general media media world. world. Um, In the soap opera opera of ad tech, is there a plot line or plot twist that you have right now you want to tell Um, us about? I don't know that I have a, 
a plot twist other than there's so many players that are out there. I think that, uh, yeah, I, I, sorry. I don't know that I have a, a, a plot twist that particularly comes out. I think we know what, you know, who the major actors are, what the plot twists are. I mean, I'm very encouraged and excited, you know, about what I'm seeing out of Amazon right now. And I'd say if there was one, if there was one curveball, everyone should see coming. It's the exciting things that Amazon is doing as a, as a company to embrace, uh, you know, the overall ad tech ecosystem. They are, I think, are the company to watch over the next two to three years. They have incredible data. They have a deep understanding of how the ecosystem works. They're very pragmatic in their approach to how they uh, think about the different ecosystem partners. And they're very open, frankly, uh, to partnering. When I think when I think about what I love about ad tech, right? And I'll sure. relate this back up to Amazon. Most ad tech companies rely on it. Sorry. Oh, oh, that's very random. Yeah, it's very random. Most ad tech companies rely on an interconnected web of pipes in order to really? succeed. If I win, my SSP partner wins, my publisher partner wins, the DSP wins, right? We're, we are an interconnected ecosystem where... Rising tide. Yeah. One person wins, six other people won along the way. That's not the case for the silos, right? Right. In, yeah. in fact, it's actually the other way around, right? It, you know, you could say when Apple wins, other people lose. When Facebook wins, other people lose. Right. It, it's not the case for the silos where everything they do is interconnected with other people winning. Amazon really gets that. And, and the reason why I say if there's one plot twist to look out for why it's Amazon is because they're building platforms to enable other people to win when they win. And that is really unusual for a company of that size. And that's why I think that they are they are, uh, you know, one of the most exciting emergent they're not emergent at this point. Uh, you know, tens of billion dollars, it's not emergent, but one of the most exciting players because I think they got the equation right. In order to win, everybody's got to win. And that's what excites me most about, you know, the future, their future and what they're going to contribute to the ecosystem. If you could have um, lunch with anyone on a desert island, who would it be and what would you eat in the, in the ad tech industry? In the ad tech industry, wow. Um, it's so funny. I feel like I've gotten to meet uh all what i'll call my ad tech heroes right uh, uh a along the way um is that when you knew you made it you're like oh my gosh this is brian o'kelly yeah a guy know, who actually has his own you know moniker be okay yeah i mean i i feel like at, yeah i think that is part of it i i've spent quite a bit of my career in ad tech initially being an outsider you know, where you desperately try to get those meetings or desperately try to get those rooms to being a person that eventually was able to make it into some of those rooms and, and have a voice. And so, yeah, I feel, uh, I do feel like um, there are a lot of people that I, you know, I would love to be on a desert island with. I'd say the most fun person to probably be on the desert island with is uh, Tony Katzer. And, uh, and the reason <laughs> is, sure. is because yeah. both he and I are both big fishermen. And if we were on that desert, you, you, would, you would never starve. We would ne it's it's not just one meal. It's, yeah, it's the multiple. Two of us would be catching fish left and right, having a blast and yeah. eating, you know, everything that we caught. So I'd have say he's gone fishing yet. I have gone fishing with him and we slayed it. Uh, so I would say, you know, just because of his skill set, he's the right person for anybody to take to a desert island because he knows how to reel them in. So if you were, every super has its orange origin story. So what's the saga of Drew Stein? Oh, easy. I was told many years ago, you know, I had a, a company prior to this. I was told that I was too nice to be an ad tech CEO. Um, and that, that I was, that this was a rough business. And that uh, you couldn't build a virtuous company. And, um, and I never forgot uh, those person's words. So uh, your so, mom would be proud of you, right? Oh, there's no doubt. Um, when you think about our mission, uh, when you think about not just clean, intelligent data, but that we use the word virtuous, it's a very specific word. And it's a word that kind of goes back to our origin story of why 
well, you know, you know, why we have this mission, why we are so obsessed with wearing the white hat and being on the side of the consumer. And I talk a lot about, you know, creating an ecosystem where the consumer wins, the agency and brand win, and the publisher win. I truly believe that this is the moment where the good guys do win. Right. And being virtuous is the only path forward if you want to be successful in this business. And maybe there was a time when there were a lot of bad actors getting away with a lot of bad behavior. And that's part of why this industry got the reputation that it did. But that is not the case today. And the actors that are working hard today and succeeding are the ones that are virtuous. So I know exactly that moment where my origin story for Autogen personally began. It, and it's when I was told that I was too nice to be a good ad tech CEO. So what would you, uh, I always ask people, if you could send yourself a text message when you started in the industry, what would you tell yourself? And would you listen? I would just tell myself to stay the course. And, you know, and listen, I've, I've had su tremendous success and, you know, and I've had extraordinary failure. I've seen the ups and downs. I've been a part of those roller coasters and I would trade any of those experiences they're all the experiences that got me to this moment uh where you know we have such an exciting product and exciting company so you know what i know is for me as an entrepreneur you've got to love the ride you've got to love the ups and you've got to love the downs and you've got to be able to take it all in stride and uh and never waver from the, the mission and, and so yeah that's what i would tell myself fearless Take and that's our show. Thank you, Drew, for coming on. Uh, special thanks to Troutman of Men, LLP, deserved to win when it matters most. Facing multi billion dollar bet the company litigation, no problem. That's what we're here. Have a great day and take care.